Great. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm happy to represent the School for the Future of Innovation Society, which is part of the College of Global Futures. And today we have an exciting guest, uh, Rabbi Dean Shapira, that sounds like many of you already know. Uh, for us, it's an exciting talk because we, we, we don't often think about how do we leverage innovation to prepare clergy to support people in that they serve in kind of a rapidly changing, digitally connected, um, now climate challenged world. And so I've been working, I've had the pleasure of working with Dean Shapiro uh, in thinking through how do we prepare clergy? How, how would they, what are the ways that they would be thinking about the messages that they're bringing that are informing people about the, I'll say unsustainable, or at least, you know, um, difficult to manage and think through how we are going to sustain um, so that they feel hope and positive uh, as they go forward. So Rabbi Dean went to college at Harvard where he studied sociology. He's got a master's degree from Hebrew Union College. He was ordained in 2008, is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, he's worked multiple careers, everything from movie business, um, to I guess where we're gonna hear about today uh, as a rabbi and now he's working as a kind of designer for other rabbis and other clergy more generally. Um, he's been a congregational rabbi for 13 years in the US and now he's overseas, which is where he's talking to us today. Um, he was a global justice fellow from the American Jewish World Service uh, where he's traveled overseas and looked at civil rights issues. And, and I think right now, you know, he, he's here to really help us think about how he is preparing clergy to navigate the, with those and to support those they serve through a kind of rapidly changing digitally connected world with a focus on helping them and their community adapt and respond to the climate change that, that is kind of pressing on so many of our futures. So without further ado, I will welcome Rabbi Dean Shapiro. Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you for the introduction and for all your work on the Joseph Project. Um, I deeply appreciate uh, both of those. It, uh, it's interesting, we don't often think about innovation with religion. We think of religion as something that is static and ancient, but of course it does evolve. And if we want it to evolve in a, in a thoughtful way, in a way that adapts appropriately to our new times and, and to uh, today's people and tomorrow's people, then we need to innovate in that sphere as well. And that is precisely what the Joseph Project is all about. So I'm going to introduce myself in a slightly different way from the way Sasha did, but I would also appreciate it as I do that if you would introduce yourselves in the chat as well. Um, I'd love to ask you to share your name and where you grew up, but please, not the name of the place where you grew up, but rather the type of place where you grew up, the environment where you grew up. Was it coastal? Was it desert? Was it an urban environment or chaparral like I did? Or maybe a feature of the environment like a river or a mountain that was there. And as you do that, I will share with you that I am now in Taranaki, New Zealand. Uh, so that is in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand on the West Coast. It's circled there. Uh, the city is called New Plymouth. And this is a picture of Mount Taranaki. If I were looking out the, uh, the other side of my house um, and it were a nice day, not the rainy day we have, that's exactly what I would see. And below there is, is the coast. I, I drive by that every day as I take my son to school. And I am here on the traditional lands of the Te Ati Awa Iwi, um, who were the original inhabitants of this land. <clears throat> I did though, spend the summer in a very different environment. I spent the summer in the Grand Canyon and on the Colorado River. So after 10 years of living in Arizona, I went rafting and hiking through the Grand Canyon and I learned something. A river is a story. It starts long ago and far away. Its origins are shrouded in mist. It twists and it turns until it ends far in the future where it kisses the sea. The story of the Colorado River is told by native people who lived their lives by its banks, by explorers who made every mistake and who somehow mostly made their way through. 
by entrepreneurs who poured their pockets into the waters and by river guides who put their backs into it. And the story is told by ordinary folks like you and me who go for a ride on a dark brown snake. As I sat there one night in a literal bat cave, I thought how lucky I am as a Jew to have my own powerful story, although not quite as ancient as the Colorado. It's my people's story and it binds all Jews together. And th it is this, we were slaves and now we are free. Avadim chayinu ata b'nechorin. That is the essential Jewish story. We were slaves and now we are free. And I thought of how often I've used this story, told this story as a rabbi, how it touches Jewish souls when we are at our lowest. I've reminded people of this story in their hospital beds and at graveside, in prison and at psych wards, and in my office as marriages float away. It's a story that we feel in our kishkas, in our guts, and it helps us understand who we are. All peoples have a great story, and I'd like you to consider what is yours? What's your super narrative? The one that your life story weaves into like a fiber in a rope. If you don't have one, you're probably not part of a religious community because religious communities have great sacred stories such as this one. But I bet you do have one. After all, the United States has one. Science has one. What is your sacred story? Here's the thing, life on earth is going over the falls. We know it. We can hear the sounds of the rapids approaching like a dragon bellowing in the distance. And it has a name, climate change, climate crisis, climate catastrophe, collapse. Ice caps are melting and sea levels are rising displacing millions of people and aquifers of fresh water as it does, interrupting transportation and sewer systems. Soil is being depleted, making it harder to grow food. Global fish stocks are plummeting. So are insects. Great swaths of forest are dying. Human migration is increasingly global due to all of these factors. Rates of asthma and other health impacts are increasing. These things are already happening. Tem in Arizona, temperatures are rising, which may not be a problem for most folks, but for the elderly, for those who already struggle to pay their electric bills, for those to work outside, how will they cope is the wrong question. Rather, how will we cope? How will we adapt? Now, certainly governments and corporations must correct our current course, but the pain of the climate crisis is not felt in the boardroom or in the halls of power. It's felt locally. And that means that it is locally where we'll need to find and create and remember the tools that mitigate the pain caused by climate change. We'll need local communities to adapt to new local realities. So I thought for a bit about how to create resilient, bonded and caring local communities all around the world. And then I realized we don't have to, they already exist. And the truth is we couldn't create them even if we wanted to because true communitas, the sense of community, the spirit of belonging, that can't be jump-started if it is to be deep and enduring. Communitas where people really care about each other requires a shared story as well as common language and symbols 
It needs shared beliefs and understandings and systems that work for the members and leaders who are known and trusted and who know and trust their people in exchange. Such communities, I realized, already exist in the millions around the world. Churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, gathering houses and prayer circles and meditation houses. And they have leaders, clergy people and spiritual leaders. So now I want to ask a question and it is not a rhetorical question. Please answer in the chat. What are clergy people? What do we do in people's lives? What roles do we play in community? It is such a complicated, multifaceted role. And many of us in, only interact with one or two facets of what it means to be clergy. But as Sasha pointed, one of clergy people's job is to help people find deeper meaning, to tell meaningful stories. Interesting that the first two comments both use the word meaning. Counselor, guide, confidant. Thank you, Dan. To facilitate community, yes, indeed. Clergy are conveners, are connectors. David, there are many and various. Can you name a couple? What are some that you've experienced? Foundational points. Facilitator, thank you. As a congregational rabbi, I was certainly a counselor and uh, particularly a pastoral counselor. I was a teacher. I was a social worker, a creator of ceremony and ritual that facilitated transition for people. I was sometimes a shoulder to cry on. I also think we can call clergy the original influencers because clergy people have profound influence on the people in their community's lives. Now, according to, and let me bring this up again because it's worth taking a look, the US Bureau of Labor, St Labor Statistics, rather, there were over 52,000 clergy people in the US in 2020. And the National Religious Coalition on Creation Care estimates that there are over 350,000 religious communities in the US today. Statistica.com says that a fifth of Americans attend church or synagogue on a weekly basis, a fifth on a weekly basis, and that almost 40% consider themselves to be very religious. And the last two statistics, 48% of Americans say that religion is very important, 25% fairly important, come from Gallup, who uh, did this research in 2020. So that is about 75%, three quarters of our country that find religion very or fairly important in their lives. So while the numbers are declining overall, that's some 66.5 million and 133 million Americans who regularly listen to ministers, rabbis, imams, and priests, and of course, far more than this outside the United States. So when climate change hits, local communities will look to these leaders for help, for hope, for meaning, as we've said, and also for real world skills. But right now, those leaders aren't trained for that. It's not part of our seminaries or our graduate schools. And we are too busy teaching children and getting ready for services and supervising staff much of the time to research and consider the big ideas. We are not ready. 
and we need to get ready. By get ready, I don't mean advocate. Religious communities have started to advocate government and corporations in earnest, advocating and agitating for better policy and practice. That's important. And here I want to uh, point out Pastor Doug Bland, who was with us and who has run Arizona Interfaith Power and Light so beautifully doing such important work in the state of Arizona. But when I say get ready, what I mean is to learn how to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change, to learn how to adapt our lives for a new reality. Clergy can inspire great numbers to take positive considered action and leave lives more in balance with nature. They can prompt local, acts, local action and organizing, and they can reduce suffering. Some already do. As the environment deteriorates around them, local communities will need to stick together and support one another. Religious communities can improve quality of life by establishing priorities like caring for the elderly, establishing cooling and heating centers, providing temporary housing, kicking off food drives and clothes drives, creating libraries for sharing clothing and tools and toys. They can establish mutual aid societies. They can teach how to garden and knit and cook and first aid, the things we're gonna need to be able to do. And they can invent new communal models, but, they need skilled leaders to do so. Clergy can also help realign our collective relationship with the environment. Are forests part of God's creation or raw materials to be harvested? Is wilderness to be feared or embraced? Are human beings part of the world or separate from it? Are we custodians or are we consumers? And what do our sacred texts say? In addition, clergy are experienced at helping people find meaning through change, pain, and loss. Climate grief, which is sadness and anger and despair and confusion and melancholy and helplessness centered on worsening life outcomes due to climate change, Climate grief is real, and we will need guides as we experience it. Clergy can inspire people to take positive, considered action and to lead lives more in balance with nature. The Joseph Project will train the trainers and help get people ready. I remember it very clearly holding a baby in my arms, getting ready to give her her Hebrew name and welcome her into the covenant of Israel. And as I looked down at her tiny head, and as I looked out at her parents and grandparents, I thought, what will life be like for this baby in 30 and 50 and 70 years? If she stays in Phoenix, and if she lives to old age, she's expected to experience 147 dangerous heat days per year with temperatures over 150. That's 40% of the year will be dangerous for human beings. She was born into a mega drought and things will only get worse. Food production in Arizona will fall migration will increase. She will suffer due to climate change. And so I thought, this isn't just a blessing. I need to give a charge. And so I sat and I thought and I thought and I worked and I reworked until I had language I could use at today's baby namings to honor the birth and to celebrate it for sure but also to acknowledge in appropriate language how fraught this time is. 
to charge parents and grandparents to raise this unique and powerful and vulnerable child well. And I think of the hundreds of bar and bat mitzvah kids I've worked with. For each one, we've stood in front of the holy ark together and they've told me their truth. And as I've looked into their eyes, I thought, am I doing right by them? What will the world they inhabit 50 years from now be like? Today's 13 year old will be 63 years old in 2071. So when we speak of the end of the century, that's not a distant date. It's within the lives of today's children. Looking into children's eyes, the ones who will live on the planet we create and leave behind us, that's a deep motivator to get busy doing the right thing. And that's why we're starting the Joseph Project for the Global Future. So we are housed in ASU's Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory, which is a leader in the pro-future movement. And we take the Global Futures Laboratory mission to heart. It is work that is rooted in the conviction that we can and must make a meaningful contribution to ensuring a habitable planet and a future in which well being is attainable for all humankind. The laboratory draws on ASU's deep commitment to use inspired research, our ongoing work in sustainability and service to the global community in which we live. So, our goal is to train clergy of all traditions to steward their communities through the challenges of climate change and loss. And our mission is to prepare local faith communities for distressed environmental futures by creating shared space and curriculum through which religious leaders from a wide range of wisdoms will produce and share knowledge and train to lead. So what is the Joseph Project? How does it work? The Joseph Project will create online learning environments for clergy. We are doing this with Thrivecast and ASU professor Sasha Barab, whom you met earlier, and who's waving to us now. For each course, we will build a unique digital learning environment that gives clergy learners access to subject matter experts through video and audio and written materials. Grouped into cohorts who move through the modules together, they'll be prompted to create meaning and to create materials that they can use in their own unique communities. And then within their cohorts, learners will share the materials they create and reflect on one another's work in real time, exchanging ideas and inspiring one another and improving each other's creations. That's really the, the genius and the power of the uh, Thrivecast environments that Sasha creates. In working that way, they'll build relationships across religious traditions, forming a network of thought partners. The courses continually expand as learners contribute. So this is a highly interactive, mobile-first environment for robust learning. And each course has five modules. So I'd like to share with you the very first of these, our pilot course, to give you a sense. That's Sasha, in case you hadn't seen him enough of him this morning. So our pilot course is called Rising Waters. And that is because one primary impact of climate change is sea level rise, expected to impact hundreds of millions of people, especially in large cities along the coast. Mega storms will inflict substantial damage. Sewer systems are failing already. Access to fresh water will diminish, drought will appear elsewhere, and wildfires will be bigger. Some of our communities are already impacted by flooding, and many more will be in coming decades. 
So it is time to make a plan. But the concept of flooding is ancient and it exists within most world cultures. So clergy need to ask ourselves, how do our religious traditions contemplate flooding? And what can modern people learn from that wisdom? Further, many clergy people feel like they are drowning in responsibility. And that's unhealthy and unproductive. So we've got to get ourselves and our communities ready for rising water and its inverse drought. The work is meant to be both intellectual and practical. I can remember coming home from wonderful rabbinic retreats full of camaraderie and rich metaphysical texts that we studied in Hebrew, and then getting back to Tempe and realizing it was Thursday and I still needed to write a sermon for Shabbat and that nothing from my retreat would be appropriate. In the Joseph Project, clergy will create materials for use with their people. Let me bring that slide back up again. So the five modules, as I mentioned in this initial pilot program, scholarship. We hope we will gain a deep understanding from paradigmatic Western flood stories in order to ground our exploration, deepening our understandings of what the central flood story says about God, about humanity, and about civilization. So we'll engage our intellects with big ideas. Here we'll have lectures about the Noah story from theologians from various traditions, and our clergy learners will consider these and uh, compare them and compare their own theologies with the theologies presented there to harness flood stories to advance their own thinking about God, humanity and society and theodicy. In our second module, Stories and Poems, we will be asking our clergy learners to find their own language about flooding and drought by creating their own story and liturgy and poetry. So we'll have a repertoire of stories and poems that clergy people are telling, and then we'll ask our clergy learners to make their own, tell their own, and then to comment on one another's work. And our third module we'll go within and ask, how does it feel to get flooded as the clergy person, as a professional person today who carries the responsibility of an entire community on their shoulders, but also in their heart and in their head. So we'll have psychologists from a range of traditions who are offering wisdom here in a way to honor our own emotions and experiences as clergy people. In our fourth section, we'll get a little bit wonky as we look at climate science and policy and advocacy. We'll understand the water reality for the religion in which, excuse me, the region in which our community resides. Who has power? What uh, elected officials, what corporations, what public bodies impact policy? What is expected for, uh, for water in our region in the decades to come? And what can we as individuals and communities do about it to create uh, better public policy? And then lastly, number five, within community, to literally prepare our communities for what will be done, to craft readiness plans for our community as our water reality changes. So those are overviews of our pilot course, which we are actively and currently putting together even as we speak today. So there are a few, oh, I know what I else wanted to do. I also wanted to share some of the, um, to give some uh, direction of, of future courses that, that we uh, hope to bring online in, in the future. To look at poetry and prayer, to ask tough theological questions. What does it mean to believe in God, to trust in God in difficult times and not just in good times? What do our holy days have to teach us about the seasons and living within the natural cycle? I'm not gonna read all of them, but uh, some of them I think that are incredibly powerful, like deep time. To be, I think, a religious person means not to think just about the day or the week or even about the year, but to think generationally and beyond, to think in terms of millennia. 
how do we bring that kind of awareness to ourselves? Uh, so often we uh, look up into the night sky in Phoenix and see a couple of stars. Well, what can contemplation of the heavens teach modern people about enchanted places, about accessing places where wonder and majesty still remains? How do we make our communities sustainable? How do we prepare adolescents for a new reality? What kinds of rites of passage do they need for a new time? So these give you a sense of where we uh, want the Joseph Project to go after its initial pilot course. And then following these courses in our third phase, we will make these clergy only learning in, uh, environments available to churches and synagogue and religious communities so that a clergy piece person who's completed a course can then bring it to their congregation and use these materials to inculcate a conversation within the community itself. So with all of that, I'm going to pause at least to see if anyone has any questions. And then if time remains, we might do some, some more learning together. But let me stop here and see if anyone has any questions. Um, and Melissa, I'll ask you, is it okay for people to unmute themselves or would you rather questions go into the chat? I think that really is up to you. Um, well, then feel free to unmute yourself. I love to hear people's voices. And we're not that big a group. Rabbi Dean, it's great to see uh, your face again. Uh, we miss you in Arizona. Thank you, Doug. Um, of course, we needed the Joseph Project 20 years ago. Amen. So, so my question is, uh, when uh, can we get started with this? Thank you. Um, well, uh, Sasha and I are already started building the first one. And um, it is my hope that it will go live and uh, that we will have um, our first learners available to us in January. Um, so far, just in the last couple of weeks, I've been putting the word out. And in fact, you, Doug, are on my list to, to um, invite in today. Um, and uh, the response has been really strong, um, including I'm really um, uh, kind of delighted to say from the Vatican. I wrote to the Vatican and did not really expect an answer, but heard back um, with a referral to the U.S. Conference of Bishops, and, and they responded very eagerly today. Um, so uh, Sasha and I are actively building it, and it's my hope that in, in January we'll be able to put our first few cohorts through. With your help. It might be, maybe there's an AZIPL cohort. We would certainly do whatever we can to promote this. It's so important. Beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Or a thought to share? Could you clarify what um, you mean by practicing clergy? So some, you know, like who is this geared towards, I guess, specifically? Thank you. That is a terrific question. So what I mean by that are bona fide religious leaders, uh, folks who lead their communities and who have had appropriate training to do so. So there are seminaries where people study for years and then become ministers and pastors and imams, um, and those folks are absolutely included. Um, indigenous communities have their own process of, uh, of training and initiation for leaders. So all of those folks are absolutely included. Um, where it gets, uh, the people I don't mean are, for example, universal life ministers, people who fill out a form and then are um, uh, ordained and are allowed to, to perform weddings and things like that. Those people have not gone through a process of formation and transformation. Um, that is really required. Now, I am also aware that some communities like Quaker and religious science and LDS don't have formal clergy. At this point in our process, they wouldn't be involved, and I will tell you why. And that is because 
there is some kismet, something really powerful that happens when people who have been through the formation process study together. We have a shared awareness, even if we don't have a shared language, and certainly a shared experience, and it heightens the, ex the experience for everyone. It might be that after we finish the cohort, we decide that we can have what I might call a para-clergy or um, a community leader uh, um, a cohort. That's certainly a possibility. Um, but at least right now in these early days, I'm, I'm seeing those as separate groups. Does that make sense? And what do you think of that? It does make sense. I'm also thinking respectfully that sometimes the people in uh, church congregations that actually can get a food bank running or a community service pantry or a closet or a you know donation spot running aren't necessarily the clergy. And I say that really respectfully, but there's always kind of an administrative operational element and but that, that does still have that spiritual element and would need that scientific element and could be supportive in that way. So when you're talking about para clergy, I could see, you know, the volunteers, the, the superstar volunteers, or <laughs> like, like I come from an LDS faith where we have a lot of volunteers, but they, none of them are, I guess, practicing clergy or whatever, but there's still that organizational element that would benefit from this. I could Abs see. Yeah, absolutely true. So I, I would, um, I would say two things. Our our, con our third phase is considered as a two congregation. So that if, uh, if a, a rabbi or minister takes the course and learns about it, in our third phase, we'll have the materials adapted for them to bring to their community. And separately, you're entirely right that there's a whole cohort of people. I love the term super volunteers. Um, uh, they have been so important in my career. Um, and they speak a different language and they have a different experience. And so we may very well need to adapt the courses for them. But I, I think you're absolutely right. They are folks that, that, that get stuff done. And not every religious community, as we've said, um, functions on the clergy model. That's absolutely true. Dean, I think it's a real powerful opportunity just in response to these questions that um, if you had to say, you pick a minimum of like a dozen people who were these super or who were parents who wanted or, or were as a group and said, hey, we, we have come together, we have brought a set of 12. Could we be a cohort that you guide through the experience together? And this is why you know, it'll be worth your time and what we want to do with those ideas. Um, there, I, I think there's a lot of freedom to be responsive in that form. And, and I, I would assume that uh, Dean would, would jump on those opportunities and be very excited. So. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, the environments Sasha creates are really adaptable. And uh, that's part of the beauty of them. Um, I do think that they would need to be adapted from clergy focused language to super volunteer language. It's a different experience, but also valid. Absolutely. Thank you, Jessica. So we have a few more minutes and I would like to play an idea through with you if, uh, if you don't mind participating and learning along with me. Um, but this is going to be a highly interactive uh, aspect uh, of, our, of our hour together, so I hope you will participate. And I'm going to ask this question. What does the climate future hold for Arizona? What, what do you know is, is heading Arizona's way? And you can either unmute or put it in the chat, whichever seems right to you. Dangerously hot days, indeed. Hotter, drier, more populated, yes. And that um, loss of animal diversity. Thank you, Danielle. 
Uh, drier also means uh, decreased snowfall. Thank you for mentioning fires um, uh, and flooding as well and water scarcity. All of that is true, yes, especially for houseless and outside laborers, um, uh, limited ability to, to get outside. Um, one more piece I'll just add to this, and that's the impact on agriculture of hotter and drier days. So now let me ask you, as folks from a range of religious traditions and presumably some who are part of no religious tradition, but can you think of texts that speak to this situation? Um, increased homelessness. W what are some either sacred texts or secular texts that speak to the uh, issues of, of heat and water scarcity, uh, of wildfire and agriculture? It, that's the way a, a clergy person thinks. What, what texts go to these? And Doug, you can be my ringer if you want. Genesis and the creation stories. The concept of Shemitah from the Hebrew Bible that one year in seven, the land lies fallow. Doom, that magnum tome, um, a, a desert planet. Yes, a, a vision of whom we might become. I can't help but think of Ezekiel's vision of the valley of dry bones. And I also think of the Midrash of Miriam, Moses' sister, the prophetess, who had a sacred well that followed the Israelites through their wanderings through the, the desert and that whose water was used to nourish the people. So when might stories like these be shared with a community? How might they be put more deeply into play in a religious community's conversation. I think I think Dina, um, because we're working with some churches and stuff, there's yeah. an emergence of non-building based faith groups coming together to support growth, which is interesting. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, among Christians that, you know, the, the, the taxes might change, um, for example, that might make churches harder to, in their current form, maintain, right, but all of a sudden. And there's a lot of talk right now about how do we create more groups coming together around topics to grow their faith, almost as like a local, you know, study group, but in, in different ways. And I think that's really interesting. Um, model that might fit some of what's come out of this whole hybrid lifestyle of like online and face-to-face. -face. I don't know how that would work in your form. Well, I think, uh, I think precisely as, uh, as you mentioned it, that uh, contemplation, for example, of the tax structure, understanding, right, it's in the headlines today. So let's read a sacred text about taxes because there's a lot of taxes in the Bible. Um, and uh, and then have a study session uh, and a workshop it, within our community would make a whole lot of sense. So if temperatures are rising and water is growing scarce and wildfire is proliferating and economics are getting shakier, what could churches and synagogues offer our people? Let's brainstorm that a little bit. Whether they have a building or don't have a building, what could they do? These are hard questions. And they really require some thought. And I mean that word require in two ways. Require in that they have to be thought about, but also that the answers aren't super easy. So Pastor Doug has mentioned using, bringing the symbols of outdoors inside and visit with the people most impacted by warming, right? Many of us never 
uh, meet the day laborers who work outside. But what if a church or synagogue were to have a meeting with a crew and get to know what their experience is and listen to them and facilitate that conversation? How powerful might that be? What might it lead to down the road? Guidance, consolation, and community in addressing climate crisis together. David, I completely agree. Can you think of some specific ways that we might do that? How might folks be guided? advocating green lives together. When I think about churches and synagogues with buildings in Phoenix, we often have drinking fountains. And I think about how often those drinking fountains are placed inside the building so that they have uh, easy access to for the people who enter buildings back when we entered buildings regularly and in big numbers. But what would it mean if synagogues and churches and mosques put water fountains on the outside so that people who were walking down or whose car broke down would have access to cool water? What would it mean if these religious communities helped families create emergency kits and craft evacuation plans. What if they taught gardening like we did at Beth Shalom here in Auckland? Imagine if clergy people around the state and the country and the world began thinking about these questions actively, creating plans and putting them in place now. We certainly wouldn't eliminate the impacts and disruptions of climate change, but we could mitigate some of them. We could adapt to some of them. Aware of the time, I just want to wrap up by first of all, sharing my email address there, dean.shapiro at asu.edu. And also to share the reason we've named this the Joseph Project, for the global future. Joseph, you might remember, was a Hebrew who was kidnapped, sold into slavery in Egypt and made a prisoner there. He was also, as a young man, someone who was able to interpret dreams on God's behalf. And while he is in prison in Egypt, he interprets two dreams. And later on, the Pharaoh of Egypt has a dream about seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph is summoned before Pharaoh and interprets the dream and makes the plan. We should, excuse me, we should uh, gather up our harvest now while it's bountiful and let it be used in the years to come when there is famine in the land. Let it store up now for use later. Now it strikes me that we are still in the good years. Things are still functioning. Many people have enough food. There are systems in place. In general, our lives are good, most of us, but we know what's coming. So let's not waste this precious time. Let's store up our wisdom now, our techniques now, our insights now, our relationships now, because they will be needed in the coming years. And with that, I will uh, pause and I want to say thank you so much to Melissa Waite for organizing today's event and Sasha for your introduction and uh, for being here and for all the work you are doing as my partner on the Joseph Project and to thank you one and all uh, for being here. I'm gonna bring up my email address one more time so that you know how to reach me. I would love to hear from you uh, with, uh, with any ideas that you have, any way that you would like to be part of this, I welcome you. And I say thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you for everyone else also coming to attend.